focusing on Mary Fisher, who in the year 1657 decided she would go and talk to the Sultan of Turkey. And to go back to why she was going to talk to the Sultan of Turkey, um, you've come a long way forward from Zarathustra. Um, Quakerism, if you have to find a place for it to start, because nothing starts from nothing, of course, we say 1654. In 1654, a man called George Fox began to preach. And the essence of his preaching was really very simple. He said, the Spirit of God is freely available to everyone. There is something in everybody that responds to the divine spirit, however you want to conceive of it. And therefore, you don't need a minister because there is no need for anyone to mediate the spirit of God. You don't need rituals. You don't need any rites. And even the scriptures are secondary because unless you are guided by the spirit of God, you can't interpret the scriptures. So it was in some ways a very liberating religion and in some ways I suppose a rather frightening one because you had no um, boundaries. You, you had to go and see where it led you. But it came out of Christianity at the time of the English Civil War. Um, Cromwell is um, the head of England at this time, it's this period. And it was a time of big um, social and spiritual upheaval, and there were lots of new ideas going around. Now, certain things followed from this idea that the divine spirit is freely available, and one is it must be equally available to men and to women. Um, Mary Fisher was one of a group who we always call the Valiant Sixty because they were more or less 60 in number, depending on how you count them. And they were responding to a letter which George Fox sent from prison saying, be valiant for the truth. I don't think these days they were called Quakers, were a bit before it got that organized. And of this valiant 60, about 12 were women. It's not your absolute equality, but this was the 17th century England, and women had been pretty well nowhere, so it wasn't a bad start. These 60 went out and began to preach, maybe with more enthusiasm than tact, I think, some of them. <laughs> and they went forth two by two, sort of like the animals from Noah's Ark. And they popped up everywhere. They popped up in the middle of church services to the discomfort of the minister. They appeared on market days. They were said to have spoken at wrestling matches. <laughs> um, on every green hill, every green sward, they uh, went forth to preach. So I suppose one can be a bit ambivalent about them. I mean, I have to confess, I hate these people who accost you as you go shopping <laughs> and ask you if you were saved or something like that. But on the other hand, I'm jolly glad they did or the teaching would never have come down to us. In a way, I think, they kind of filled the gap that's now filled by buskers. You know, there wasn't a lot of public entertainment at this time. And so going to hear a preacher was much more of an entertainment than it is today. And a good one can get a bit of an audience, you know. Anyway, Mary Fisher was one of this group. In, she would have been about 33 at the time she went forth to preach. And um, she, she was not an illiterate woman. She was, although she was only a servant, she could write. But I don't think she wrote with any ease. So unlike some of the early Quakers, she didn't read journals. This is good in a way, because it means you can fill in a story as you like. <laughs> we haven't got it all. Um, uh, but she, she could certainly read her Bible, as people then were starting to do. And it was quite a revelation to them to read the Bible. That, my goodness, that's what it says. <laughs> They've been told for years, but they hadn't seen it. So she, the first time we come across her, she was in Cambridge. Now, the Quakers were never well received in Cambridge, because part of their teaching was that it didn't help you to study 
at Oxford or Cambridge and become a minister if you had not actual direct understanding of the Spirit of God. And the people who were studying for the ministry didn't particularly want to hear this, so there was a bit of a riot in Cambridge. And Mary Fisher and her companion were arrested under the Vagrancy Act. The Vagrancy Act was an act against rogues, vagabonds, and sturdy beggars. <laughs> I'm not quite sure, quite sure which of these groups they were meant to be in. But the, the punishment was that you were stripped to the waist and flogged in the marketplace. Um, this might have deterred many people, but it seems not to have deterred Mary Fisher because the next we know, she's off to Barbados. And we don't know a great deal about what happened to her in Barbados, except she apparently had a better reception in Barbados than she did in Cambridge. And I think that a, a sort of Quaker group was formed there. Next thing we hear of her, she's going to Boston. Boston was the home of the Puritans. They'd gone to America in search of religious freedom, but unfortunately they didn't intend that it should be extended to anyone else. And they were not at all pleased to hear that the Quakers were coming. Um, so when they got off the boat, they were seized and thrown into prison, and their pamphlets were burnt. Um, they were in prison for five weeks while they waited for someone to deport them, and they boarded up the windows because they feared they'd get up and preach out of the windows. And actually, they probably only survived because of a rather remarkable man by the name of Nicholas Upsall, um, who seems to be like a, an early human rights activist. He heard these women were in prison and he went and bribed the jailers to feed them. Um, and so they were still alive at the end of five weeks when they were put on a boat. They nicked their Bibles, which I thought was a very low act, and gave them to the jailer. I don't know if he was a particularly pious jailer and wanted the Bibles. It seemed a strange thing to me to do. Um, there's a subsequent tale about Nicholas Upsall. After those lot of Quakers left, they passed another law which said if any more were to come, they would find the shipmaster who brought them, which was a discouragement. But should they land, they could be publicly flogged and imprisoned with hard labour until they could be deported. Um, Nicholas Upsall said he thought that was a bit harsh, and for this he was fined and expelled from the colony. He set off to walk to Rhode Island from Boston, where he thought he would find a gentler form of government. And on the way, sort of fainting by the wayside, he was picked up by an American Indian and looked after. The American Indian is said to have said, what manner of God have these English? But to return to Mary Fisher, Mary Fisher goes back to England. She is not discouraged, apparently, by this experience either, and declares that she has received a um, message from God that she is to go and talk to the Sultan of Turkey. Now, this, I think, is rather as though a sort of Southern American Baptist received a message to go and talk to Osama bin Laden. <laughs> the said that the Sultan of Turkey was easier to find. <laughs> but he was sort of, you know, the bogeyman of 17th century England. If your children didn't eat their vegetables, you told them the Sultan of Turkey was coming to get them. But there was another result of believing that the Spirit of God is everywhere available. Because it must therefore be available to people of all faiths. This will not come as a shock to anyone in this room, but it was quite an extraordinary idea in England in its time. And, um, and though they believed the Spirit of God was available to people of all faiths, I don't know that they had much contact with anyone of other faiths. Um, they knew about the Jews, and oddly enough, they knew about the American Indians, and there are examples of George Fox 
claiming that the American Indians had the divine spirit, which came as a shock to many English people. And I doubt that anyone would ever have seen a Turk, really, certainly not in the area where the Quakers mostly came from, which was up in the north of England. The might say Turkey. <laughs> they might have seen a Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Turkey. <laughs> But anyway, uh, this was what she felt she had to do, and she got together a group of people who said they would go with her. There were three men and two other women, so three men and three women got on a boat and set off. Uh, we know that they put in at Smyrna, where they were met by the British ambassador, who said, for goodness sake, go home. But no, they continued on their way, and next thing we know, they're in... Greece in a place called Zeppo. I have no idea where it is. Now, alas, in Zeppo, it appears that the others chickened out. Um, I don't think they said they chickened out. I think they said things like, I feel that God is calling me to go to Newcastle upon time. <laughs> but Mary Fisher knew exactly where her calling was. She was to go and find the Sultan of Turkey. And she set off on foot, and somehow she walked to Turkey. Nobody knows exactly how or what route she took. I think it's a great pity, you know. I, I sort of feel that there should be the uh, Mary Fisher pilgrimage. We all ought to go and try and walk in her footsteps and see how she did it. And she ended up in a place which I cannot find on the map, called Adrianopolis where the Sultan was sort of on manoeuvres. This was the height of the Ottoman Empire. He was out um, defending his empire and putting down rebellions, I think. And so whenever we draw pictures of it, you always see pictures of this kind of tent city. I don't know if it's true. But that's how it's always pictured, that there's all these tents. And Mary Fisher arrives, I don't suppose she spoke a word of Turkish, and how she found interpreters, I do not know. But she went around this camp, asking people to introduce her to the Sultan. She said, because I am an ambassador from God, and I've come as an ambassador, and I want to talk to him. The majority of people said, my goodness, please go home. But somehow she got the ear of the vizier, and whether because she was an impressive woman, whether because she was a novelty, and they didn't have too many English women walking in off the street, so to speak, he said he would introduce her to the Sultan. And an audience was arranged, and quite a few people turned up for the entertainment, and in came Mary Fisher, and she stood there in silence for some time, until the Sultan said, um, do you want me, you know, are you nervous? Do you want me to send some of these people away? No, 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 she said, I am an ambassador from God and I'm just asking him what I'm to say to you. <laughs> uh, what exactly she told them, of course we don't know, of course it's not recorded, but she said that she told them about Jesus. Of course they could have known about Jesus from the Quran, but I don't know if she knew that. <laughs> And also, the way they talked at that time, and she was a woman of her time, was that um, the light of Christ lights everyone who comes into the world, and so we all have access to this divine spirit. Um, when she finished talking, she asked them if they'd understood, and they said yes, they understood, and um, what she had said was the truth. They then said, and what do you think of Muhammad? At which she gave for her time, I think, quite a sensible reply and said, I don't know anything about him, but you know, and you can judge for yourselves. But any prophet must be judged by what he says, and you shall judge the words whether they are true or not. The Turks seem to have been very good to her, certainly a great deal better than the Christians of Boston. Um, they offered her gifts, which of course she could not accept, because you may have, their feeling was you mustn't take payment for spreading the word of God. But it is recorded that she accepted a pair of slippers, and actually 
I don't doubt that her feet were kipping her <laughs> after all that walking. They then said that they would give her an escort back to Constantinople, which is a no no no. She was perfectly capable of walking. She walked a long way already. And as far as we know, she walked to Constantinople, and I imagine she then took a boat. But we really don't know how she got back because she hasn't left. We do have the letter she wrote when she got back to uh, another friend, which said, I have been and spoken to the king as I was instructed, and he was very noble to me and those around him. They fear the name of God, many of them. They are more near the truth than many nations. Now, this is always spoken of by Quakers as a really successful mission. And I think it's interesting because no Turk ever became a Quaker. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, it confirmed what they thought, that the light of God was everywhere. And if it was in the Turks, then as far as they were concerned, that was it, it was everywhere. <laughs> and they'd proved it. Uh, and, um, George Fox, you know, used to say that the light of God is shining in the Turk and the Jew. And that covered everybody as far as they were concerned. <laughs> um, so that is all I know of the story of Mary Fisher, but I think she was the most fascinating woman. <laughs> in a religion as unequivocally egalitarian as Quakerism is, um, do you have a canon of any kind? How do you know whose stories to tell? Well, does it matter whose stories you tell? No. Stories are stories. Um, no, no, we don't have a canon. Um, what, if you want to find sort of what is Quakerism, we put out a book called Quaker Faith and Practice. Actually, there's one from England, there's one from Australia, there's one from New Zealand. And we update them every few years. Because what speaks to people of one period doesn't seem to speak to period people of another. And, and we believe that God continually reveals himself and that not everything that was written by the early Quakers has to be true or true for us. Um, you know, you have to keep seeking new truth and finding new truth. So, no, <laughs> we don't have a canon. <laughs> I think um, the problem that I've always come across is the question of authentication. If, for example, um, the light of God is in everybody, mm -hmm. um, then is it the domain of any person who happens to have a voice inside their head um, to say uh, that, indeed, this yes. story is now, a reflection or an expression of God. Rather fortunately, at the time of George Fox, there was already a group in the north of England known as the Westmoreland Seekers. These were people who dropped out of churches and were meeting uh, as groups. And they had developed a kind of business method uh, whereby they met to consider matters of common interest. And this imposed a kind of sort of group check on the excesses of the individual. And this we have today, that um, we have business meetings where we consider matters of some other things like you know, raising money and spending money. But any matter of um, principle, any matter of how to act, even a matter of personal, if I feel that I'm called to do something, but I'm not sure about it, I, we bring it to the group. And so the group acts as a check upon the individual. Um, in the business meeting, we have to act by consensus so that it can sometimes take quite a while and often waiting silently, you know, to know what is right. And sometimes coming back and doing it the next month and the next month and the next month uh, until you really know. Um, and through this, I mean, things have changed over the years. Uh, to, to give a simple example, the Quakers were one of the first groups to abolish, to refuse to own slaves. 
And, you know, it began with individuals saying, I don't think we should do this, and continually bringing it back to the business meeting, saying, no, we're not to do it, we're not to do it, until everybody agreed, and they all got rid of their slaves. Sometimes by physically the whole lot moving over the state boundaries, so you could do it, because there were states where you couldn't. So it was a big step. Um, I mean, I've been, one of the things I've experienced is that we had gay and lesbian members who kept coming and saying, we want a statement that there is no distinction um, in the society between hom homosexual and heterosexual members and that all are equally uh, enlightened by the spirit of God. And this came back again and again and again until we agreed on the statement. It went over years. But when it was done, everyone agreed to it. So that's the way it has to go. Have there ever been examples where um, some very conservative views have simply refused to be shaken? Well, sometimes over major issues, you'll probably find one or two people who have left the society. That, that has happened. Um, There is a system whereby on matters that are not, that you don't feel a real sense of conviction on, you can say, I don't think this is right, but I will stand aside and be guided by the group. So this will happen on some matters. Um, but I don't know, it works, it mm. works. It is very interesting because normally um, when things are done by group meetings, you see a certain amount of um, status quo st stagnation. Mm. Um, and you would think um, that the opposite would happen, that rather than, for example, gay and lesbians um, mm. having full and equal status mm. or women being given mm. equal status, um, the opposite would happen, but the group would prefer to hold on to its current power structure so that men keep their power and heterosexuals keep their power. Well, you know, you have to come to the meeting thinking, I, my mind is not made up. It's quite a good discipline. Um, if people come thinking, I know the truth and the others don't, it won't work. But you have to come saying, I am open to what will be revealed now. And... Um, change. I mean, people come convinced one thing is true and go away convinced it isn't. But it doesn't always happen quickly. And there, I mean, in any organisation, there's a tendency because, you know, there's the essence of the faith and there's the culture, you know. <laughs> and um, so it's hard to overcome your cultural prejudices and what you feel um, is what you've been brought up with. And Quakers, too, um, acquired some sort of peculiar Quaker ways, um, which they from time to time had to shake off. I mean, the, you might have seen the pictures of people in the Quaker dress. Now, that was the the plain dress of, the, of a period, but it became very quaint. Um, it was the simple dress of a period, but it got that way, you really had to go and find a Quaker bonnet. <laughs> it was a huge trouble. Um, but, you know, that's, once this has become the, the, what you do, it's quite hard to shake it off. And there was finally a big conference at which people got together and said, we have acquired a lot of peculiar ways and we get to lot of ways. And to see if we're really meant to have them, and they threw a lot of them out. <laughs> but you can only do it if you believe that God is continually revealing himself, or herself, or whatever, however you want to see yes, God. Yes, we, don't, yes. we don't have a um, definition yes, yes. of the divine. 